Good morning, Oak Bluff Bible Church. It's good to be here with you this morning. My name is Christian Lowen, and I'm the very new uh, pastor here at church. And it's an exciting time in my life and in in the life of the church, too, as there's a lot of changes coming with the new building and and with the new pastor. I'm not sure how you guys feel about that. Well, I am sure you you guys have given good positive feedback so far. Uh, But that's besides the point. It's good to be here with you. Uh, in these changing times and uh, a lot of things are new and exciting and that's a lot of fun so I'm just happy to be here with you this morning so would you join me in opening this morning with a word of prayer Jesus we love you we thank you that your presence is here thank you that you dwell among us and that you're Emmanuel God with us thank you that you're close and you're personal And you hear us, Lord. You hear our prayer and you respond. And we thank you for that gift. Lord, I pray this morning um, as we hear what your word has to say on on the church and what it means to be the church uh, in these changing times, God, I ask that our hearts would be open, soft, and receptive. And uh, that you would sanctify us and make us look more like Jesus as a result of this morning. Lord, I pray that... um, that the only person being seen and receiving glory this morning would be the Son, Jesus Christ. We love you and we we sit before you as children that are, are loved and are washed in the blood of Jesus. Amen. All right, so I've chosen to entitle my message this morning, Being the Church Amidst COVID-19. Last Sunday, I talked a little bit about um, what it looked like to just to be people alive in in the midst of a global pandemic, and and the the two ditches of response that there there's the road of godly right response, but then the, there's a ditch of fear, and there's the ditch of proud indifference. And we kind of broke that down, and whatever. This morning, I want to talk to you more so about how do we do church in the midst of these government restrictions what are what are the bare bones essentials for the church of of what god requires of us um as a church we know as as restrictions have been placed on us we haven't been able to meet sunday mornings um we know that we haven't been able to have youth group the same way but the youth have been split up into smaller groups just a lot of things have changed and it's been difficult i think for many much has been stripped away in this season and our pattern that we've gotten used to has become disrupted but this begs the question what of what we were doing was essential and what was perhaps only a routine now just because something isn't necessarily essential to the church doesn't mean it shouldn't be disregarded or abandoned routines and traditions aren't necessarily bad things for example the um, yearly weekend family camp that we had to cancel this year, that isn't necessarily essential to the church. It's not necessarily something that we see in scripture, but a weekend family camp is definitely in line with several biblical commands, like the importance of breaking bread together or sharing meals or the command to not forsake the assembly of believers, the command to, to get together. And uh, so, yeah, just because something isn't necessarily essential doesn't mean that it isn't good and that it shouldn't be practiced but but many of our traditions and routines that we have become accustomed to are edifying and beneficial and we should continue to do them as we are able but the point of this message is more so to remind ourselves of like i said before the bare bones essentials to our calling as the church the thing that the bible prioritizes first and then to come into agreement with the word's definition of what a church is, what a church is supposed to do. So what what are the hills that we as believers die on in regards to what the church should look like? What do we not give up in in the the wake of the, the COVID restrictions? Well, let's go to the scriptures. Uh, a very, very reputable, uh, infallible place to go uh, when we have questions like this. Let's take a quick look at at the very first church um, that we ever see in all of human history and observe the original purpose and function of the church. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. And we'll read that. And, and those of you that know a little bit about Acts know that this is 
these chapters, you'll see titles like the beginning of the church or, or Pentecost or, or things like that. This is just, um, we find ourselves just seven weeks after the Passion Week. Jesus had come or he had died. He had, he had risen from the dead three days later. Then he walked on earth for four weeks. And and as he as he was ascending into heaven, he said, hey, wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit is poured out on you. The Holy Spirit gets poured out in Pentecost here, actually in the same chapter, the beginning of the same chapter, the Holy Spirit gets poured out and boom, we find ourselves in in the middle of, of a sermon that is preached by um, the disciple Peter. Um, many people are confused as they hear the disciples praying in tongues and things like that. And, and they ask for a response and Peter responds with a long uh, message. And then we find ourselves right here in Acts chapter 2, verse 40. What it says is, And with many other words he testified, this is Peter, Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now here we observe the church in its purest and most simple state, setting the standards for what the church should be. We don't see any programming. We don't see any children's church. We don't see any specific um, discipleship groups. We don't see youth groups. We don't see worship nights. Um, we just see the very, very stripped down essentials of what the church looked like back before it had a chance to develop and all these things that are, that are good things. But, but this goes back to the, the basics. And I've broken it down into seven specific practices that we can observe here in Acts chapter two. Number one, it says that the believers continued in the apostles' doctrine. The early church faithfully sat under the teaching and preaching of the word. They consciously allowed themselves to be taught and fed, thus allowing themselves to be built up in the most holy faith, as it says in Jude 1, verse 20. It's important for us as believers to routinely take in good teaching. And it doesn't matter if that's podcasts or if that's, um, you know, good edifying sermons that you can find on, on, on YouTube or on, on Sermon Index or, or reading a good Christian book. But the importance here and the emphasis is on the fact that we allow ourselves to be fed uh, on a routine basis as believers, not, not only by ourselves as individuals, but also as a group. So that's number one, that they gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. Number two was fellowship. The church was vigilant in meeting together in person. Well, there's no such thing as lone wolf Christianity. So much of the Bible is devoted to instructions of how to relate to one another in the church. And if we distance ourselves from the church, well, then much of the New Testament can no longer be put into action. And therefore, it can no longer be obeyed. That, and then there's the outright, out and out command that we see in Scripture of not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as in the matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, as it says in Hebrews 10.25. The church must maintain fellowship if she should be healthy and obedient. If you think about it, take the, the fruit of the Spirit, for example. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can't operate in the fruit of the Spirit locked up by yourself in a cabin in the woods somewhere, right? You can't show love to someone. You can't show patience with someone. You can't show self-control in, in holding your tongue. You can't show gentleness if you're by yourself, right? The Bible requires us to walk in community and in fellowship with one another. And we can't be obedient, healthy believers if we don't live in fellowship and in community with one another. So continuing in the apostles' teaching, fellowshipping together, 
Number three is the breaking of bread. In verse 42, it says the breaking of bread. Now, what does that refer to? The breaking of bread here in, in verse 42 is the referring to the observance of the Lord's Supper or to communion. The breaking of bread later on in the chapter um, refers to something a little bit different, and we'll get into that. But here in verse 42, um, Peter is speaking of communion or the writer, sorry, the writer of Acts, rather, uh, which would be Luke. So about seven weeks, as I said before, seven weeks before our Acts 2 passage takes place, Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper as a symbol that believers were to routinely take part in to remind themselves of his sacrifice on the cross. Luke 22, verses 19 to 20 says, And he took bread, giving thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. So this, this new um, practice was, was still very fresh in, in the believers' minds, right? It, they had, if they hadn't been there, if they weren't one of the 12 disciples and hadn't been there when Jesus instituted this, they would have heard of it and, uh, and realized that this was a command. And, and so this is still fresh in their minds, and they partook regularly in the Lord's Supper, in communion, to remind themselves of Jesus, their Savior, and of his sacrifice. As believers, too, this is why we take communion, because of this command. And this is one of the essentials of our Christian faith and something that must be continued in together as believers, or maybe within these COVID restriction confines, um, together as families, that kind of thing. Next up is prayer. The, the disciples met together in prayer. And this point is fairly self-explanatory. Relationship with God requires conversation with God. And thus, prayer was essential, yea, the lifeblood of the early church. In Matthew 21, 13, Jesus dubs his house, the church, a house of prayer. And the Holy, of, and the Holy Spirit was poured out in the midst of a corporate prayer meeting in the beginning of Acts 2. An obedient and biblical church meets regularly for corporate prayer meetings. Next up is communal living. The disciples walked in communal living. What does this mean? Did they live in a commune like uh, like David Koresh and uh, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas? No, not quite like that. Uh, <laughs> at least, thank goodness it's not like that. Uh, but they, they were communal in that Acts 2... 44 and 45 says that the church had all things in common and that those who had resources gave freely to those who did not. Thus, the well-off were freed from the temptations of wealth and the poor were freed from the struggles that poverty and lack would provide. Therefore, the early church looked after one another and saw their resources as tools to bless and help others, putting others above themselves. I think this is this is especially important in 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 these times of COVID for for us as a church, as a lot of people are are taking a financial hit as as work is is affected and maybe they aren't working as much as they used to. It, it was important for the early church to look out for one another, in the same way it's important for us as believers today to look out for one another, not only in in prayer requests but actually in sharing our resources with one another. In, in the Book of Acts, people would literally sell land and and assets that they had just so they could give money to the church um, that would be distributed to the poor. And uh, it it kind of sounds radical, but but this is early bare bones Christianity, the church. And uh, and I believe that the calling is remains applicable today. Uh, second from the last, I guess it would be number six, is that they daily met in the temple. The early church was diligent in meeting together in public large gatherings. Now, these meetings at the temple would have been different and larger than the individual groups that made up the church or the, the house churches, if, if you will. Much like a Sunday morning service in comparison to, say, a, a small group or a care group. It was important to meet in a large body and to be of one accord together on a regular basis. The, small group, the smaller groups maintained unity with, with other small groups by meeting routinely in a large public space as a bunch of small groups. And this is something that uh, myself and, and, and Pastor John have talked about, is that do we want to be a church that 
just has care groups or do we want to be a church made up of care groups? And I, I, I think that the care groups, small groups are, are very important. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the church not only met in those small groups, but they all came together in large groups as well. And, uh, and it was encouraging for them. I know personally for myself, um, recently I've enrolled in the ordination, the EMC ordination course uh, through through our church, and I'm 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 working towards my ordination. Hopefully this spring, but we've we've gotten together as various members of the EMC conference from around the world. I think there's someone from from Jordan or or Syria that was that was in our, our Zoom chat as as ord- ordination candidates, and it was it was just exciting for me to see that the church is bigger than myself. It's bigger than Oak Bluff Bible Church. It's bigger than the the EMC Region Seven that we are a part of, but there's there's global believers and and we're connected together. It's awesome. It's encouraging, I think, for our hearts. Another example is um, the the young adults worship nights called Bread We Break that have taken place in Winnipeg for the past uh, two or three years. If you hadn't had the chance to go, it's it's really a, a great opportunity as believers, young adults from all over Winnipeg, all over Manitoba, really come together. And worship the Lord together, and it's it's very encouraging for me to realize I'm not alone. My young adults group isn't alone. My church isn't alone. But there's a big body, and uh, it's it's an encouragement. Obviously, that is uh, that looks a little different meeting in large groups these days. But I think the the implication is there that we remind ourselves that we belong to a bigger body, and and that's the important part. And lastly, number seven. In verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, the breaking of bread here refers to instead of the Lord's Supper as it does earlier earlier in the chapter. Here in Acts 2 verse 42, the breaking of bread refers to, or sorry, in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, the breaking of bread refers to the Lord's Supper. But here in verse 46, it speaks of hospitality. And literally having members of the church in homes to break bread as in sharing meals. Hospitality is in the heart of the early church and I believe is in the heart of Jesus. I mean, we see him feeding the masses twice. He feeds uh, 4,000 people one time, 5,000 people another time. We find those, those stories in, or those accounts in Matthew 14 and 15. And we also see Jesus in Luke 24 making breakfast for his disciples. I mean, Jesus was a hospitable man. He... He provided food for people. He didn't just, um, didn't just invite them over to to McDonald's or to meet at McDonald's or Tim Hortons or whatever. He actually had people and and made and gave them food. I I guess the first two or when he did it for the masses it was miraculous. But in, in Luke twenty four, he's actually there on the beach cooking the the disciples breakfast, which is what a kind of neat thought. Jesus making making someone breakfast. But uh, hospitality is an act of service and a vulnerability, and it creates and maintains unity amongst believers. And therefore, I think it's essential to us as a church having other believers into our homes. So there we are, the seven practices that the early church prioritizes their chief purpose and function. Number one, continuing in the apostles' doctrine, which was receiving teaching. Number two was fellowship. Number three was breaking of bread, as in communion. Number four was prayer. Number five was communal living, which was sharing what we have and and looking out for others. Number six is daily meeting in the temple, which means reminding ourselves of of the larger church body. And number seven is hospitality, having other believers into our home. So these are the, the biblical essentials to a healthy body of believers. And amid the COVID restrictions, I believe that these are the core practices that we as believers have to hold on to. I think this is a cause for excitement, personally. This isn't just a time for us as a church to to put everything on pause or put everything on hold, hoping that everything holds together and that when the pandemic blows over that we're all going to be uh, the same as we were back in the the winter of 2020. No, rather this is a time of reset where the Lord is asking us, I believe, as a church to be reminded of what the church truly is. Not merely a building and not merely a Sunday morning service, but around the week fellowship of believers who look out for one another, learn together, pray together, serve together. The list goes on. 
So how do we be obedient to this call to fellowship and meeting together amidst the indefinite COVID restrictions? I think that's kind of the, the question at stake here or at hand. And I think that there are a few answers um, to this question. There isn't one perfect answer, but I, I think there's a couple different ones. Um, first of all, I think of my home church. Jessica and I, our home church is in, in Portage La Prairie. It's also an EMC church uh, where my dad is a pastor and Jessica's dad is actually a minister, uh, funny enough. But what they've done through COVID is they've broken the church up into regional groups. So they took a, a, a picture or a map of of Portage La Prairie and Central Plains, the areas around it, and they broke it up into, I think it was six or seven groups, uh, regional groups. So if you were in the northeast part of the city, then you got together. If you were northwest, if you were closer to McGregor, if you were closer to Oakville, they broke up into, into regional groups. And I think that that is an option, meeting in small groups um, that are within the confines of the COVID restrictions. I think that's an option. I think Zoom and other technology, FaceTime, I think that's a, a good way for us to, to get together. Yeah, I know it's frustrating for me too, and it's, it's not the same. Even even now, you guys watching me on the screen and me looking into a blank camera eye, it's not the same, trust me. But uh, it's a way to continue and, uh, and, and to be in fellowship and to remind ourselves that, hey, there's other believers out there and, 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 and that we can talk to them safely amidst the restrictions. Other options include parking lots, and uh, and I know there are a lot of parking lot meetings coming out in the in the spring there, and uh, and I met I mean we met in the on the church parking lot all summer. That's that's an option for us. Obviously now as it gets a little colder, maybe not so much, uh, but that is that's an option. I I mean this this whole thing, this whole situation we find ourselves in is an opportunity for creativity. I think a lot of churches are are re thinking how they do things and and it's exciting as 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 we jump over these hurdles and and figure out these obstacles it's it's cool it's an opportunity for the holy spirit to give us creativity to do church in ways that we've never done it before and although i do believe that meeting in person is the best solution and that it should be prior although i do believe that meeting in person is the best solution and that it should be prioritized as restrictions allow. There's just something special about meeting in person with someone and, uh, and, and meeting in person in, in small groups together. And that leads me to an exciting announcement. And that is that we as a church are kickstarting our care groups program now here in November. We are planning on having three care groups happening on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday evenings to suit whatever your schedule may look like. And there, are, there will be more details to follow. That's all I can really disclose right now. Uh, but it's something to be thinking about. Why is attending a care group important? I, re I personally think it's extremely important for us as a body. And especially now in light of COVID and the, and the restrictions to meet in small groups. I think that this is kind of the only option almost that we have to to function as, as a biblical church and walk in, in, in some level of, of fellowship. That and, and technology, I should say, or I think kind of our two options. But I think those are kind of our only two options to walk in the example of the Acts 2 church. But apart from that, I, I think just care groups in general are, are very important things for us as believers in our, in our Christian life. First of all, I think that, that care groups provide an atmosphere where we can be vulnerable in a way that we can't in a, in a Sunday morning per se. It's a, it's a place where every, everyone can have a voice in, in those regional meetings that I was talking about before that are, ha are happening in, in Portage um, at, at our home church. We've heard people say that they don't want to really go back to big church anymore because they like the vulnerability and they like the fact that everyone has a say instead of just sitting back and, and hearing the pastor talk the whole time. Small groups are a place for conversation and discussion and where you can actually say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I need help. It's also a place where we can be accountable with one another. I think that's kind of one of the big concerns out there is that that people aren't being held accountable. You know, back when we could go to church every Sunday morning, you notice when someone isn't there, right? And you could call them up and say, hey, Notice you weren't at Sunday, you know, everything all right? You know, not to be nosy, but just to be, to be accountable, right? We're brothers and sisters. And now where everything's just online, you don't really know and you aren't really held accountable. 
not that that Sunday morning being at church is the be all end all, but but seeing one another is is has a sense of accountability. That I think is really important. I think that small group is also a great place for asking questions, whereas Sunday morning is is more of a teaching time. Like I said before, small group or care groups are a good time to ask questions that have, that have been burning on your heart, things you need to bounce off other believers. Small small groups or care groups are also an opportunity to pray for one another in a in a very tangible way where you can actually voice your prayer request and have someone immediately pray over you verbally. It's exciting. You can look after each other's needs, as we were talking before in, in, in Acts chapter 2, how there's communal living. It's hard to do that on Sunday mornings, right? Where you just come in, sit down, you know, talk a little bit afterwards, sip some coffee, listen to a message, sing. You don't really share your needs or it's it's not really the place or it's not comfortable, maybe. Um, whereas care groups, it's it's more communal, right? These are friends. Care groups are also a place where we can digest what has been taught on Sunday mornings. Maybe we're having a hard time with certain things that the pastor said. And by all means, I, I should say this, that if you don't see something, some, if something that I say does not line up with Scripture, please come confront me. Come hold my feet to the fire. I My voice is not the Word of God. I, I submit myself to the Word of God completely. So please, 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 if something I say is out of line, come and approach me. I, or send me an email, something. I, I, I don't want to... It's a weighty thing speaking, and, and I'm accountable to the Word of God. But care groups are, are a good place. All that to say, care groups are a good place to digest what's been said on Sunday mornings and to work through stuff together with people, to, to not only hear the message once, but then to kind of regurgitate it almost and, uh, and, and talk about it again. Care groups are also a place for deeper... Friendships, as you as you have people into your homes uh, and have just conversations beyond how the what the weather's like, I th- I think deeper friendships uh, can grow in 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 the space of a care group. There's also more opportunity to serve, as 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 the group is smaller, there the the roles aren't filled up as 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 quickly, and and kind of everyone needs a role to to keep the the care group going. There's opportunity to serve. There's also opportunity to be heard. Care groups give a safe place for leaders to grow. It might be intimidating getting up on a Sunday morning and speaking behind a pulpit, but you know, if you see someone in, in your care group who's who's developing and, and you can see that there's a, a hunger for ministry in their heart, uh, care groups are a great place for leaders to, to maybe share a little devotional or to start growing in their ministry gifts. I think that care groups also fosters community i think community thrives in smaller numbers in a way that it doesn't in in big numbers for example living in oak bluff the community i think is a lot stronger than for those of us that live in winnipeg there there isn't much of a a winnipeg community besides jets games and bombers games i guess but uh, besides that there isn't that community feel that you that you might feel in a small town and lastly, I think care groups are a better and maybe less intimidating intimidating space to invite friends um, who have questions about the Bible, who aren't believers. I think that, that care groups are a much more warm and inviting place to invite someone than than a Sunday morning and, and a place where they can come and, and have their questions answered. So I hope that gets us all thinking and, and praying about the benefits of small group and, and praying about the possibility of joining a, a care group this November. So there's more details on that to follow. In the meantime, let's pray about it. Um, I think that care groups are really important and, uh, and I would encourage each one of you watching to, uh, to think about that and then sign up for a care group when the time comes. Now I want to change gears a little bit. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church and we want to take some time praying for that persecuted for the persecuted church globally. Now, the persecuted church is actually a church that is largely made up of small care groups and house churches, similar to the church that we find in Acts two, and similar to the church that I think that we are encouraged to be in these uh, amidst these COVID restrictions. So, it, 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 see, it, it kind of all ties together, right? Um, persecuted church. Meeting in small groups together around the world out of necessity, not because of COVID restrictions necessarily, but because of 
of danger for their lives and, and, and for their well-being and for the lives of their family. And uh, it's, it's important for us to, as believers to take this day not only to pray for the believers, but also to remember the believers that are being persecuted. Colossians 4.18, written by Paul, it's, it's right at the end of the, the book of Colossians. It says, this salutation in my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you all. Amen. It's, it's a reminder that, or he's asking that we remember his chains, or I guess he was asking the Colossian church to remember his chains, but I think it's also applicable for us as believers to remember the chains of our brothers and sisters globally. To forget them, I think, is an injustice, and, uh, and it's important. So let's remember them, and, and in Acts, or sorry, and in Second Thessalonians verse 3, we are exhorted to pray for the deliverance of those that are being persecuted. Second Thessalonians 3, 1 to 2 says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered for un- from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. This is a, a, a plea from Paul. May we be delivered from our persecutors. And I think that that's also a biblical way to pray as we focus on... on uh, a little bit of time here at the end in praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. So let's close this morning off. I have I have a, a, a video I'd like you to watch. It should be in the in a in a link below. But let's watch this encouraging video that encourages us to per, to pray for the persecuted, and then let's spend time in our family groups or with whomever you're watching this morning's sermon, and let's spend time remembering and praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. That's my encouragement to you. Let's let's focus as believers on on what it looks like to be a biblical apostolic church today in these covid times. Let's st- let's stick by our guns on these things and uh and let's think about the importance of care groups and how that's one of the very important parts f- or ways for us as believers to walk out that acts to calling. And yeah, let's spend time in in prayer for our persecuted brothers and sisters. So I'm, I'm going to close in prayer and then I'll, I'll leave you with that video and, and you can break up uh, into your groups or, or as your family and, uh, and and pray for the persecuted church. So Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the exhortation for us to continue being the church, Lord, that we aren't, we aren't just a Sunday morning gathering, but our, our lives are being the church god it's it's a 24 7 kind of thing lord and i i pray that we'd be obedient that we'd be faithful in in getting together with believers and walking out these uh these seven ordinances that you you lay out for us in scripture god lord i also pray that um those that are are, are listening lord that that we would be convicted to uh to join a care group lord if that's what you have for us in this time i know it's it's not feasible for for everyone in the church right now, but for those of us that, that have the time and, and and have that desire in us, God, I ask that we would be obedient, not just think about it, but actually do it and, and join up with a, a, a care group, Lord, this, this November. And also, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters globally around the world, Lord, um, who are being persecuted for their belief in Jesus, for the fact, for, for loving you, Lord. It's... Uh, it's something that we haven't experienced here. Yeah, we might be teased here and there for being a Christian, but we haven't been really persecuted. And God, I just pray for strength, for deliverance on our brothers and sisters globally. Lord, that you would enter prison cells and that you would enter um, hiding places this morning, Lord, with your presence, your spirit, that you would encourage them, that you'd lift up their heads, Lord. Lord, families that have lost their father, whose whose parents have been executed and the children are trying to raise themselves, Lord, or 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 girls that have been taken and have been been raped and have been brainwashed and have been married off to um to terrorist groups lord god there's just so much it's, it's heart wrenching lord and and our thoughts and our prayers are with them we pray for deliverance lord lord for eritrea sudan ethiopia iran iraq lord we pray north korea jesus vietnam myanmar lord China, God, we pray for your deliverance. We pray for your power to move amongst the persecuted church. Move, Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. So I'll leave you to watch that video and uh, and then spend time in prayer for the persecuted church. God bless.